Hi guys, my name is Filippo Nassetti and I'm the tutor for the Grasshopper class, beginner class on superabundance fibrous tissue. Just to give you a few coordinates about myself, I'm a designer, an architect and generative designer. And I started working in 2012, founding MOX, which is a generative design research group, me and Alessandro Zomparelli, fundamentally. And then throughout the, year, throughout the years, I started working at Zaha Did Design and teach at UCL The Bartlett in London. What we're going to see today is a grasshopper based workflow. It's a design technique that is leading to very specific type of outcomes and design outputs. So before getting into the software and getting into the details of what you have to install and how the platform works, which will follow, I would like to give you an introduction over the design technique, the method, and the type of images and morphologies that we're getting out of it. The inspiration for that are fibrous tissues. So the images that you see here are images taken from a, a, one of those super, super highly defined microscopes of tissues of, uh, uh, I think the images on the top are of paper, while the others are maybe more organic, like carbon fibers and so on. And you can see this richness and this big amount of these quantities of fibers clustering and coming together to form a tissue which has different densities, different orientation of the fibers, and those can potentially perform in a different way. So the idea since the beginning, the research started at MOX, and we wanted to try to understand how we could simulate these tissues in a biodigital environment. And by doing that, we started looking at certain type of algorithms. In particular, we focus on the shortest walk algorithm, uh, which uh, as the diagram shows here is in fact very simple. So imagine that there is a grid, you can see a Voronoi grid on top and an Octa grid at the bottom. And then you want to compute the shortest walk onto that grid to move from point A to point B. And that's what you see in the second image. And basically the algorithm is computing along that grid the shortest walk, moving on to the edges of the network. Um, and then the last step is the step of post-processing. So the, the curve, the, the connecting path doesn't need to be necessarily polygonal, but it can be rebuilt as any other curve. And this is what gives quite a bit of expressivity to the, uh, to the, the outcomes. Uh, as you change the grids, you get uh, a very different type of uh, uh, networks. As you can see, that you, we can talk about the resolution of the network, meaning the amount of detail within a unit. We can have low resolution networks and high resolution networks. The shape of the network changes. Some of them are more polygonal. Some of them are more organic in their look. And this is something that is coming from the, from the grid. So we already start thinking that it will be very important when we start to work to focus on the fact that there is a grid and then there are connections which are being computed onto that grid. If you apply that uh, algorithm a lot of time, you get complexity. And complexity is visual richness, and uh, we can define it as lots of elements orchestrated following uh, uh, a pattern. So a pattern means that there is a regularity in the system. You can read features in these images. They are quite understandable. They are not chaotic. There is a form of order included into that. And if you're looking into Grasshopper, that's something which is definitely interesting for you. Because if there is one thing that the Grasshopper is good at doing is key ordering, like handling lots of things according to simple rules that you define. So as a procedural modeling tool, as a computational design tool, that's what you want it to do. You design the rules and then have Grasshopper apply the same rule to a huge amount of things, and then you get very complex uh, outcomes. But as you can see, the basic rules which are, which are behind this specific morphology are the one I mentioned before with the diagram that we saw. Every fiber, every unit is computed as the shortest walk onto a grid. And this opens up a space, a visual space for exploration. Um, to, it's a specific type of image that we're getting, a specific type of morphologies. 
And this can be, I'm going to show you how this was applied in different projects. So the first project I'm going to show you is a mask. You, if you haven't heard about masks before, you may have heard about our masks. And then one of them was designed using this technique. So in this case, we were interested again in achieving something that may look as a microscopic tissue, something that you look through the microscope. And by changing certain parameters in the simulation, which is the same that was used for the drawings before, based on the shortest walk, you get very different looks for the fibers. And uh, uh, these fibers can be 3D printed. What you can see here is a structure that was 3D printed. And then uh, you see this type of tissues is not something where the, individ the shape of individual fiber is relevant, but rather are the properties that emerge. The fact that you can control how density is changed throughout the tissue, what's the orientation of the fibers and such properties. So the idea is that you design a tissue by keeping in mind the overall properties rather than the shape of the single individual fiber in the apparatus. And if that's applied to a face, then it may, may become something like that, something that we can think of a possibly a, a, a sci-fi development of a face shield or something more speculative of the relationship between the human and an inhuman entity. Um, if this is a mask uh, and is a very specific direction, there can be others in which I'm gonna show you how flexible is the technique that we're working with. So the set of drawings that follow are drawings of the, it, this is a research, research strand named Arachno, Arachno Computer. It was a, a research done at UCL de Bartlett School of Architecture. And the idea was to pair this type of drawing with models done with spiders. Now, we won't get into the details of that now because that's a bit out of the scope of this introduction. But still, you can, this set of drawing is, was born into that framework. And as you can see, there is already something quite different from the images that we saw before of the masks. Like now, the fibers look very sharp. Uh, there, there are angles between them. It's not rebuilt. It doesn't have that very organic look that it had before. The look is probably more architectural, more sharp in a way. And, uh, and, uh, and this shows a different design direction. Uh, I would like to point out again that the algorithm working behind that is exactly the same of the one that we had before. We are just changing the processing of the cures at the end. It's very important that, again, there is the idea of the tissue. So again, it's not relevant the shape of the individual item, but rather how many items come together and form a tissue that has different properties. So in some areas it's more dense, in others it's less dense. You discuss the morphology in terms of resolution. As you can see in the two images on the right, one is high resolution and the other one is low resolution. And, so, and then, so when you design using this technique and this type of morphologies, these are the parameters that you keep in your mind. Like what's the resolution of the pattern? Is what is emerging? Are there directionalities that emerge which are interesting? How can I achieve diversity within the tissue while keeping the same structure everywhere? And this can become three-dimensional. You can arrange different resolutions together and become more and more architectural. So uh, we're still at the level of the abstract prototype here. It's not actualized in a specific architectural project, but you can already see something that may resemble floor plans or sections or elevations of a facade of a building. And again, uh, these tiny fibers are designed with the same way, and that's what we're gonna see in the in the in the tutorial, in the four hours of the tutorial. They can be again produced by a 3D printing, uh, and then uh, uh, again, I think there is some elements in the language in the language that are recurring uh, before. Uh, uh, it was the mask was something parasitic onto the human. In this case, we have something which is parasitic onto the buildings, and uh, and so you see, even if the shape of the fibers changes, there are some concepts, some logics within uh, this design technique which are underlying, and you may want to keep them in consideration while you start learning Rossoper and start learning this technique and maybe adapting it to your own designs. 
and this is an application to the urban scale. So you can see there is a, a lot of elements arranged according to similar rules. And uh, uh, so the, the process, the, the work here is completely procedural by defining substrates and grids and trajectories onto the grids and variations of density, resolution, and so on. Uh, an application of this drawing technique, maybe more actualized than those, is a projection mapping. This project was done at Zaha Hadid Architects. Uh, it was a collaboration between uh, a team from uh, Zaha and a few artists like Andy Lomas and Max Cooper that did the soundtrack. And this project was a projection mapping. So it was a projection mapping in Karlsruhe. And then the, uh, the Karlsruhe has a castle. And the, this castle is not that tall, but has a very elongated facade. Overall, it's 180 meters. And the idea was to try to design an experience of projection mapping onto this facade at night, having these fibers colonizing the facade, growing onto that. So the, again, the facade of the castle acts as a substrate onto which the fibers are moving and uh, reorganizing, transforming the architecture, uh, even if only for the experience of one night. Uh, different, again, it, everything is based on a grid. The grid that we see here is something which is related to the shape of the windows. It moves around the windows while leaving them open. In this case, the grid instead is going everywhere, overriding the structure, the logical structure of the castle and uh, having a different type of uh, organization. And in this image, you can see a shot from the night in which we projected onto the castle. Um, that's it as an introduction. I wanted to give you an overview of possible applications of the design method we will work with. Um, I'm confident to say that in four hours we will cover all the basics to get to, to have an understanding of this project, how it works and so on. By doing that, you will also be introduced to Grasshopper as a tool, to the thing it can do, to the practicalities also, how to connect components, what the different components do. And this may eventually be a primer for you to start working with the tool. Now let's get more into the a few details uh, just to get a very basic understanding of Grasshopper and how it sits within Rhino before starting to um, before beginning the tutorials together next week. So if you want to open Grasshopper, you just type Grasshopper in Rhino and the window opens. So the Grasshopper window is separated from the Rhino window and it's in fact an independent file. So you need to save the Grasshopper file on top of saving the Rhino file when you have enough work and you want to save. If you don't do that, Rhino doesn't store the information about Grasshopper, so you will, you will lose your work. So it's, it's quite important to do that. Uh, the two windows are independent. If I close the Grasshopper window and I type Grasshopper again, it reopens. So I won't lose it. So the window, I can close it and reopen as long as Rhino is open. If I close Rhino, everything shuts down. If I didn't save, I'm going to lose the work. Uh, the main, uh, so if you look at the interface of Grasshopper, there is a canvas, which is this one here, where I can zoom in and out. Then there are tabs. Uh, you may have something different from me now here. So in display, well, actually not now, but when I start to work with components, you see in my case, I having uh, an icon here. You may have text, and that's because uh, I'm uh, uh, selecting draw icons. If I deselect, I lose it. And uh, uh, also, I'm selecting draw fancy wires. So if you guys want to work with settings, visualization settings similar to mine, make sure you set these two, you select these two options. Otherwise, the software, the software works just as the same, there is no difference, and eventually it will be up to you how you feel more comfortable in working with. So the main objects of Grasshopper are what we can call components or nodes, depends, it's the same. So a node is an object like that, where there is a box, an input, and an output. So the component is an object that is storing information into that. And the handles at the input and the output are showing where the information is going. 
uh, that's helpful because we're not going to work with individual elements like cures, like object in Rhino, but rather uh, formalizing a set of operations onto these components that can be repeated onto a number of them. So just to start seeing some things about Grasshopper, if I draw a line in Rhino, say that, or actually let's do a curve. I have a curve in Rhino, and then uh, I want to get it into Grasshopper, so I can type curve, and I get a, a component. So the nodes, you can access to them by either looking for them, selecting and clicking and getting them, or double clicking onto the canvas and starting typing. So this way, the, the node comes out, and then you can select it and grab it. So if I go onto the object, right click, set one curve, and I select it, and that's it. You see when it's, it changes color. So the, basically the curve has the color of the layer in Rhino, but if it's within Grasshopper and the component is selected, it turns uh, green. If it doesn't, it turns red. Now there is an overlapping, so we don't see it, but we can hide the curve in Rhino, for instance, and keep it. So this is an instance of the curve, and this is something that we can manipulate. Uh, if I delete the component here, I don't lose the curve. While uh, um, if I delete the curve in Rhino, you will see that the component is turning orange, which means there is nothing inside of it. Another thing that I can do, <laughs> If I want to draw another curve, select both, right click, set multiple curves, and this way I'm getting two curves into Grasshopper. Uh, so you see that the nodes in Grasshopper are meant to store information rather to be actual curves. And that's a difference. Um, I can connect components, like let's get a second component, I can type divide curve and then connect the curve into the input of the divide curve. You see what this component is doing is dividing the curve into points. If I go on the mouse onto the center of the component, there is a box opening up a window that is saying what the component is doing. These are the inputs. So the curve I want to divide the number of segments into which <clears throat> I want to divide the curve. And Kings does not get into the detail now. <coughs> but if, for instance, I want to change the number here, set integer, oops, sorry, set integer to 20, then the number of points changes. So this is one of the famous parameters in computational design, which are driving the operation that follow. You see, I connected the two components by dragging from the output of curve to the input of the white curve. Now they are connected. And this is how the thing works. Now, I, I won't go into all the details now. We're going to see many of these things throughout the workshop. But if you want to begin in preparation of that, to have a look at that, <clears throat> I suggest that you start familiarizing by moving components, connecting them, maybe looking at some basic example onto the Grasshopper uh, uh, website, and so on. A fundamental part of learning this tool is learning how to become independent in growing your knowledge and troubleshooting the issues that you will be facing and getting learning resources. So beyond the tutorial, I think one super important thing I need to convey you is how to learn more of this software. Um, the good thing is that there is quite a bit of community working around Grasshopper, and that uh, is providing a lot of online resources. So if you go to grasshopper3d.com, it's the forum, and here there is a lot of stuff for you uh, to check and to start uh, familiarizing yourself with.
The first part is the learn section, getting started. And here you find a number of primers and uh, manuals and video tutorials. And this is where you can get the understanding of the tool in terms of like how things work, in terms of interface, in terms of basic components and so on. Uh, I won't go through that because I believe that it's more relevant for me to convey you a specific design methodology rather than uh, just the basics of the tool. But I strongly recommend that you go through this session and uh, work with some of the tutorials and look at the manuals and you will see that the learning that you get will be fast paced by doing that. Another very important thing, thing of this workshop is that there is a forum Grasshopper support forum, and you see this is where <coughs> people post questions, and uh, people post questions, uh, and, and then like issues they're finding, and uh, people answer. Most of the time, people answer, and in this way is a way in which uh, sometimes, very often, the issues that you're facing were faced by other people before. So if you're Googling, there are some keywords regarding your query that is very likely that something similar pops out and you can see how people uh, 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 solved that before. Or you can also log in into the, uh, onto the forum and post your own question and very likely someone will, uh, uh, will answer. Another important thing is that we're going to use uh, a few plugins for Grasshopper so you can extend the power, the potential of Grasshopper by using plugins. Plugins are basically adding you more nodes, more components to play with, like the ones I have here, like Kangaroo or Lunchbox or uh, many other Weaverbird and so on. So the, basically, a Grasshopper plugin is a package with a number of nodes, and then uh, um, you can uh, uh, basically more nodes give you more options. So by Using plugins, you can extend the, the potential of the software by extending the potential of the things that you may want to do. We're going to use a number of plugins in the design method uh, I'm going to present you in the tutorial. So there is a list uh, in the brief. And uh, uh, the way to install it is quite simple. So you there will be a link that is provided. And then you go to the link. You need to, most of the time, it would be here. On Food for Rhino, you click download, and then you, cho you choose the release you want to work with. I suggest the, the latest one generally works, and then you, uh, you log in, and then you can download the, the components and so on. Uh, all of these uh, uh, plugins uh, have instructions, like as you can see here, for, for installation. They are very straightforward. And uh, just pay attention to install them all. And if you have an, any question, get back to me before the workshop and we get sorted with that. It's fundamental that you install all these plugins before the tutorial, because otherwise uh, what we're going to do won't work. Basically, you will be missing components. And so it won't be possible to perform the operations that we will do. On this, uh, I think that uh, uh, the very basic introduction is here. Uh, I, I suggest, in order for you to understand, if you have a couple of hours to go through the tutorials on the Grasshopper uh, website, that's best. So you get an understanding of the most basic things, like uh, uh, moving around, uh, knowing where things are, and so on. And then we could get started uh, uh, timely with the uh, with the design method and see how we can get as close as possible to an awareness of the design method behind such designs. Thank you, and I look forward to see you all at the session.